Okay, well, today we get to close off our series. It's the last week, week four of our four-week series in the book of Jonah. And uh, if you've been journeying with us through the book of Jonah, uh, you would know that we're speaking through this theme of overcoming reluctance. How do you overcome reluctance in your own life? And it was interesting for me as I managed to wrap up the, the or prepare for the last little bit of the book of Jonah, I was excited to think through um, and see kind of this whole theme of reluctance go full circle in his, in his life, right? So, and today we're speaking about Revival, partnering with mercy. So I'll give you the end of the message at the beginning of the message so that you can get the message as we go through the message. And that way I will might not get sidetracked because I may or may not be more than slightly jet lagged, okay? So the end of the message at the beginning of the message so that you don't lose your way along the message is simply this, partner with mercy and grace. And the question that I want to challenge you with is, are you living partnering with mercy and grace? God has revival in mind for us. God's desire is for us to live in this revival. And that's what, that's what he saw. Um, Jonah saw God do an incredible revival in his life. The, one of the most incredible re revivals to ever happen in history was seen by Jonah, but Spoiler alert, he did not partner with mercy and grace. And I guess the question to you then is, are you partnering with mercy and grace? So I'm going to pick up the story where uh, Jonah just got vomited out by the whale. And we're at the beginning of chapter 3, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. And it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach the message that I tell you. Okay, it's exactly the same sentence that God told Jonah, the first time, right? So he repeats himself. And that time it said, arose, go to Nineveh. And he arose and went to Joppa. This time it says, arise, go to Nineveh. And so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. He obeyed God according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Okay, so this statement, a three-day journey in extent, is not to say that it took three days to get to Nineveh. It says that it took two, three days to get through Nineveh. And I want you just for a moment to consider that. Now, they didn't have cars and highways, and Craig will tell you that the, the, the traffic in Nairobi is, is quite something. There was one particular point in time where we did some really good time. It, it took us, you know, 34 minutes to do one mile. It was... Um, Great progress, right? Because it's, it's ridiculous traffic at times. But it's not traffic. It's if you were to walk through the city from side to side, it would be three days walk. It is a huge city. It was the history tells us that at that point in time, it was the biggest city on the planet at that particular point in, in time. So God sends him to this great city and Jonah began to enter the city. And on the first day's walk, here comes his message, right? His message is, Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You would note that this is eight words in English, but it was only five words in Greek. And this is the end, uh, sorry, in Hebrew. In the original Hebrew, Jonah preaches a five-word message. It's a five-word message. He has five words in his message, and these five words exclude telling them about God. Jonah doesn't even introduce God. He doesn't even say, God loves you, or God wants to have mercy on you, or God's going to destroy you. Does he tell the Ninevites what they're doing wrong? No. I mean, his entire message is 40 more days, and the city's going to be overturned. That's it. That's the whole message. Talk about reluctance. Talk about doing a, you know, a, you know not quite putting your back into it, Okay. I have teenagers and I have seen chores done without putting your back into it, okay? <laughs> no particular teenagers will be harmed through this statement because we all know what we're talking about, right? Sometimes you do what you have to do, but you just do it because you have to do it, not because you want to do it. And it's very clear from Jonah's message that Jonah isn't exactly going, repent! You know, he's not exactly, there's no revival. He didn't bring the band. He's not trying to create a moment here. I mean, this is a bad sermon right here, okay? <laughs> I've taught a lot of them. I know one when I see one. 
This is a terrible sermon. 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. He doesn't give them the who. He doesn't give them the why. He doesn't give them the what. He doesn't even tell them what to do to change it. He just tells them 40 days and Nineveh would be overthrown. The little I know about Jonah, I kind of get the feeling like he was enjoying saying that. I kind of get the feeling like it was less a turn your life around message and more a ha na 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 40 more days. No? Okay, well, let's just move right along. My wife says it's jet lag. It's not jet lag. It's Jonah. What on earth is Jonah up to? He preaches a five-word message, and the greatest city on the planet at the time turns around. They repent. They totally turn themselves around. If you you read the rest of, of, of the chapter, you'll see that they turn to God. From the king. Now, this was one of the worst of the worst places. If you if you even study the historical records, that it, it makes no sense why a city that is so evil, that is so bad, would turn around. If you read the five word message, then all the more it makes no sense. The only possible explanation is that God does a miracle in Nineveh, and my suspicion is that that was God's plan all along. He didn't need Noah. Noah. He didn't need Jonah. I was going to focus and make sure I wasn't going to do it today. Uh, The tally is complete. He didn't need Noah. You see, I wanted to say Noah. He needed Noah to build a ship many years before. In this case, he didn't need Jonah. He didn't need Jonah to do the work. He didn't need Jonah to turn around the city. All he needed was Jonah to be obedient to him because God knew what God wanted to do and God was ready to turn some lives around. And that's what God does. God is the one that's able to turn lives around. Even when we preach bad messages, even when you say Noah, when you meant to say Jonah, God can do incredible things because God is God. Now, what I love about this is there's a little hidden message in the original Hebrew here. And the hidden message is that if you take the five words, and that he speaks when he, when he speaks this message. He had 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The word that he uses for overthrown here is a word that has a double meaning in the, in the Hebrew. It actually has two different meanings. The, the first meaning this word has is this idea of being overthrown. So if you go read Genesis chapter 19, verse 21, the same word is used to reference the overthrowing of a nation or the turning around or the burning of a, of a space or, the, or a city being, being overrun by another, right? So this is the negative meaning. But this word that is used in the original Hebrew here, havak, actually has an opposite meaning. It could mean to be converted. And this same word is the word that is used in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, when it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And I just love it that though Jonah had one intention for the word overthrown, God had a whole nother intention for the word overthrown. And though Jonah was saying this in the hope that they will be destroyed, God was saying this in the hope that their lives would be changed and they would be filled with God and they'll become a whole new person. There is an opportunity for you today to become a whole new person in God. The message here is that even then when the speaker is reluctant, even that when the, the messenger isn't all there, God still has the the power, God still has the ability to overthrow lives, to change around lives, to cause us to become whole new people. And I just had a sense as I was praying over this that there's somebody that needs to hear that today, that there's somebody that needs to know that you can be a whole new person in God. God has the ability to turn you all the way around. God is the one that is able to do this. God is able to do this in your life. God is able to do this in the lives of the people around you. God is able to do this in the lives of your colleagues, in the lives of your neighbors, in the lives of your family members, in the lives of the people in this great city. 
And I was encouraged reading this again and reading about this revival and thinking, you know what, there are some schools and some classrooms and some offices and some, some streets and some neighborhoods that are in need of revival in the city of Austin as much as the city of Nineveh was, was in need of revival. And I said, God, would you do it again in our time as you did it before? As you did it in his life, would you do it in our lives? Would you do it through our lives? And I guess the question is, are we partnering with what God wants to do in, our, through, uh, in and through our lives? I said at some point that the, the, the journey is portrayed by, by Jonah. This, this book of Jonah is, is less about Jonah and more about us. It's a satire, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's almost so ridiculous that we would see the truth in our own lives because of it. And I, I think in this end of the book, as we, we travel into chapter 4, there's, there's something here about the, the reluctance that we sometimes allow in our own lives, where we go through the motions of doing the God things, but we don't experience the joy of partnering with God. We go through the, Jonah went through the motions. He did, remember in the first part of the book, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. The second part of the book, he does what he's supposed to do, but there's, it's very clear that he doesn't enjoy what he's supposed to do, that he's not partnering with God. He's just doing what he's supposed to do rather than really being a part of what God wants to do. He isn't on the side of grace and mercy. Are you on the side of grace and mercy? Are you expecting the mercy of God in the lives of people around you? Are you expecting the grace of God to empower and to work through your life? So Jonah chapter 4 comes in and, and, and what happened was he preached this quick sermon in chapter 3. And when he's done preaching, the whole city turns around and here's his response in chapter 5, okay, this is the response of Jonah. He, he says this, he says, But it displeased, in verse 1, Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. It displeased him that people turned to God, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country. Therefore, I fled previously to Tarsus, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Okay, this is so ridiculous. Okay, the, the, the heathens, those far from God, just turn to God in the greatest revival ever. And here's the preacher going, oh God, I know you want to save souls. And I knew you were just going to save their souls again. I, I'm displeased. I'm unhappy. Therefore now, oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> Have you noticed that uh, Jonah has a death wish. This, by the way, there's three times that Jonah would say that he would want to die. Once he would ask sailors to kill him. Another time he would ask God to kill him. And the third time he would just sit and wait and die. And it's interesting if you think about it, that, that he's so wrapped up on the other side of grace and mercy that he doesn't even want to save his own life anymore. Then the Lord said, it is, not right. is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat in the east of the city, where there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So basically what Jonah does is he finds himself a good vantage point to watch the fireworks, okay? Because he's hoping that fire and brimstone is going to rain down from heaven and God's going to get rid of this city. Jonah is in Nineveh, but Jonah is still reluctant. Sometimes we can be doing what we're supposed to do and still be in a space of reluctance. When we started the series, we said that we're going to trust God, that we would overcome reluctance. And if we want to overcome reluctance, we've got to understand the different kinds 
of reluctance because there are different kinds of reluctance, right? So the first type of reluctance we find in the book of Jonah is the, is the indecisive type of reluctance. It's the, it's the reluctance where we don't quite do our bit, where we don't quite give our all. It's this, this reluctance that you find right in the beginning when God speaks to him and it says, God spoke to him and he said, arise, go to Nineveh. And he arose and he went to Joppa, right? He, he went in the right direction because Joppa is on the way to Nineveh, but it's also on the way to Tarsus. And I think some of us find ourselves in this space of reluctance where you're negotiating with God. You know what it is God wants you to do. You're not quite ready to say, no, God, I'm not going to do it. You're in the negotiation phase, okay? Most of the time when God speaks to me about giving something materially away or giving money away, um, I, I go through a phase of, of indecisive reluctance, right? Where I'm negotiating and hoping that God will re- forget what he's asked me to do so that I can do what I want to do. No, just me? I'm going to pray about it. Yeah, I'm going to pray about it, but I'm praying about it just long enough that I forget to do what God wants to do. Or I just, I'm in this indecisive phase. I'm this going through, just trying to see if I can wiggle my way out of obedience phase. It's in the justification phase. Have you ever been there? Has God ever challenged you to do something and then you started justifying why it doesn't quite make sense? You know, it's, um, it's interesting how that happens. It never happens when it's a little thing, but it always happens when it's a big thing. I, I, I remember once I had a conversation with somebody and he was telling me that God had challenged him to tithe of his income. And then he said, but it's not a, he, his income is so little, he'll tithe one day when he has a lot of money, then he'll start tithing. And then I realized, you know what, if you won't tithe in a little, you won't tithe in a lot. Because it's not easier to tithe when it's a lot. It's hard to tithe when it's a lot. It's hard to obey God when it's a big amount. That's when you go, well, you know, maybe, I don't know, I, what would, you know, maybe I should. And we negotiate with God. When, when God tells us to do a little thing, you know, it doesn't cost us much. We're quick to obey. When God tells us to do a big thing, to go a faraway place, to, to make a, a radical statement, to go speak to that guy that you really don't want to speak to, the, to, to forgive and to love, well, that's when we go and we start negotiating. Maybe your reluctance is that of being indecisive. The second type of reluctance we find in the life of, of, of Jonah when he's on the run, right? It's the, it's the reluctance of rebellion, okay? Jonah had a reluctance of rebellion. He went to Tarsus when he was supposed to go to Nineveh. He went the opposite way. This type of reluctance is easy to spot, right? And when you find people here, it's simple. I know what God wants me to do. I'm doing the opposite. The nice thing about this type of reluctance, as easy as it is to see, it's that easy to repent of, okay? So can I tell you a little something here? I'll, I'll save you looking through the entire series. If you haven't joined us for the entire series, if you're running away from God, stop it, okay? <laughs> That's it. It's as simple as that. If you're living outside of the will of God, Stop it, okay? It's not worth it. If you're in rebellion to that which God has called you to do, stop it. We're going to save ourselves weeks with that, but, you know, I'm just saying. Third kind of reluctance that we struggle with is the the toe-the-line reluctance. The the toe-the-line reluctance. Now, toe-the-line is is an expression that, that, that comes from doing what's expected of you, right? And this towing the line expression originates from, and I know you're looking at this and you're going, Yuri, you misspelled this. I did not. (laughs) Miracles do happen, okay? (laughs) Tow the line actually comes from in the Navy many years ago when they were still sailing wooden ships. Towing the line meant lining your toes up with the line between the planks on the ship when you got instructions. So over the years, the idea of towing the line became a statement to say, fall in line, do what's expected of you, okay? So that is indeed the correct spelling. How do I know? I Googled it, okay? But yes, some some people that love Google in the room. That's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So here's the thing. is toe the line reluctance is when we do what we're supposed to do, but we're not partnering with God. This is the third part of Jonah's reluctance. He's in Nineveh. He's where he's supposed to be, but he isn't partnering with God. He's just doing what he has to do because he has to do it. Sense it's a moment, okay? Forgive me. 
but some of you are in church, not because you love God and you want to obey God, but because you're just going through the motions of what you think you have to do. God is still going to do what God has to do, but you're going to miss out on the beauty of it because there's no intentionality to it. When, when, when Karen said we want to get rid of religious ritual, it's not that we want to get rid of those intentional rituals where we intentionally engage God with all of our hearts. We want to get rid of any ritual which is dead and which is without intention. Because if your heart isn't in it, then God will still do what God wants to do. But the person that's going to miss out on the glory of it is you. Your reluctance is stealing from you. Jonah is seeing God do more through him for the nations of the world than arguably any other Jewish prophet. And he's sitting on a hill wanting to die because God isn't raining down fire and brimstone. But God is gracious and mercy. Why? Because he is, oh, he's doing, he's towing the line, but his heart isn't in it. He isn't partnering with mercy and with grace. Are you simply doing what you're supposed to do, or are you partnering with mercy and grace? So every one of the messages in this series, we've been looking at a New Testament example of the same thing. And the New Testament example of the same thing is the Story of the prodigal son, right? But not the prodigal son. Not the son that came to his father and said, give me my inheritance. And he left and he squandered it all away. And then he came to his senses and he repented. And he came back with all his heart, with tears before his father. And he experienced the embrace of his father. And his father held him a big party. And when he, his father holds him a big party, then his brother replies in Luke chapter 15, verse 25 to 31. And this is what it says. It says, meanwhile, that word just kind of, that's an ominous word right there, okay? Meanwhile, dum, 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 the older son was in the fields working. He was working hard for the father. He was doing what he was supposed to do. He's the one that stayed behind when the brother that was supposed to work on the inheritance had left. He was in the fields working when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your brother has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. I went to church week after week after week. I always tried to do the right thing. I was always doing what I thought you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat to, for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, not his brother, this son of yours. You know, sometimes our kids are mine and sometimes they're Karen's. I know how that works. When this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. You can be in the house and not partake of what God has for you. You can be in the midst of the greatest revival and not have a part of it. You can be doing what you're supposed to be doing and not benefiting from doing it because your heart isn't in it. So Jonah sits there. And he's waiting for God to rain down his judgment on the city of Nineveh. And it gets hot. There's another storm. The storm is a wind and the sun beating down on him. But then in verse 6 of chapter 4, it says that uh, the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah. That it might be shade for his head and deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. And it's an interesting lesson in this moment, because if you look at Jonah 
chapter 3 and 4, what's beautiful about it is it teaches us the difference. Remember when Jada made the statement, she said, God, I knew you were gracious and merciful. Do you guys remember that? The two words he used, grace and mercy. If you, if you go read uh, Hebrews chapter 4, it says, let us approach the throne so that we might find grace and obtain mercy in time of need, right? So grace and mercy are these two things. Now, we don't always know the difference. In fact, in my native tongue in Afrikaans, the, the word for grace and the word for mercy is the same word, okay? It's chenada. There's not a difference between these two words. But what I've noticed is that very few people understand the difference between these two words, and that's why in some languages there's only one word for grace and mercy. What's the difference? between grace and mercy, you ask, well, this in Jonah is a beautiful example of dis explaining the difference between grace and mercy, right? Because what, when God looked at the Ninevites and he didn't give them what they deserved, when he didn't punish them for their sins, it's a great example of the mercy of God. But when, when, when Jonah is in a space where he's under this, this, um, the sun beating down on him and God empowers him. He gifts him with this plant. It's a great example of the grace of God. So here's the difference between mercy and grace. The difference between mercy and, and grace is that mercy is not getting what you deserve. When you deserve punishment and you don't receive it, that's the mercy of God, whereas grace is getting what you don't deserve. When you don't deserve something and God gifts it to you, that is the grace of God. So there's actually a beautiful um, description here of the grace and mercy of God. And when, when Jonah explains to God who he is, who he doesn't want him to be, he says, he, you're full of grace and you're full of mercy. God is able to not give you what you deserve and God is able to give you what you don't deserve. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that our God is able to not give us the punishment we deserve, but not only that, God is able to give us the grace we deserve. And that's the, the, the beauty of a, a week like this where you get to, you know, run through a couple of airports and, and, you know, go through these situations. There are moments where you need God to not give you what you deserve, and there are moments where you need God to give you what you don't deserve. Right, and that's the beauty of life. There's moments where you need to say, God, I've messed up. I haven't done what I should have in order to deserve this. This is grace. I thank you for it. And there's moments where we thank God for not getting what we do deserve because we failed and we, we deserve punishment. And that's the grace and mercy of God. And it's beautifully displayed in the story of Nineveh and the story of Jonah. But I guess the question is, is it beautifully displayed in your life? Are you, like Jonah, aware of the grace and mercy of God, but you don't experience the grace and mercy of God? Because chapter 4 goes on to say that this plant would then die, and then that's the next time that Jonah says, I want to die. Leave me alone. Let me die. Because he doesn't understand the very thing that he said about God in his own life. He, he is seeing it happen around him without partnering with it. Are you partnering? Are you joining? Are you enjoying the grace and the mercy of God? So Jonah complains to God, and the book ends with this portion right here. The very end of the book is where... The plant came up, a worm came, killed it. The sun comes up, Jonah is angry about the plant. And when he's angry about the plant, when he's angry about his situation, he, he goes on and he, he speaks to God again. He complains about all this because he didn't get what he wanted. He doesn't get what's happening around him. And God ends the book of Jonah with these words. And that's how we're going to end our series, incidentally. And the end of the book, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 10, says this. It says, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 people, persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, 
and much livestock. Now, I know you read that and you go, what, what's the deal with people not being able to discern between their right hand and left hand? It wasn't God saying that there's, you know, people that are a little slow in the city. He wasn't referring to the, this was a way to refer to kids. So back in those days, the tradition were that you would re refer to a child as someone who can't distinguish between his left hand or his right hand. So what he's saying is that a, it's a great city. It has a lot of people and there's even 120,000 kids in there that hasn't had an opportunity to choose for or against me. Should I punish them for the sins of their fathers, even though they had nothing to do with it? You have pity. So here's the thing that God's telling Jonah. He's like, Jonah, you're upset. You want to partner with grace and mercy for the plant. You want to, you're upset about the plant, which you did not deserve, me giving you what you didn't deserve. You're upset about the plant because you feel like you deserve better than sitting in the sun. And yet, should I not have pity on these people in the city of Nineveh? Now, culturally, you've got to remember that, that the context here is that Jonah hates the non-Jews, right? Because if you remember week one of the series, I told you guys that, that the, the context here is that Jonah's in this space where, where, you know, Israel is about to be attacked and taken captive by the nations outside of Israel. And he just wants to speak doom and gloom to them. He doesn't want to speak grace and mercy to them. So what he's doing is he isn't partnering with God. And it's interesting that, that this question at the end of the book of Jonah never gets answered. There's no Jonah chapter four, uh, chapter five, Chap end of chapter four. That's it. There's no verse 11. God says, shouldn't I have mercy on this city? And he leaves it there. And I was reading it and I was saying, but why stop there? I mean, wouldn't it be a beautiful end of the book of Jonah? I thought I'd write one, okay? Then Jonah came to his senses and he realized that God is gracious and merciful. And rather than waiting for the wrath of God to descend upon the city, Jonah put on his sandals and went down into the city and told them more about this wondrous God that has saved their city. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Why doesn't God end the book there? Because I don't think it was a question for Jonah. I think it was a question for us. I think he wants to end there because that's what he wants to ask us. Shouldn't we be partnering with the grace and mercy of God for our colleagues, for our friends, for our neighbors, for our city? Shouldn't we be having pity on what he has pity on or are we so taken up with the, the plants that grew, the money we deposited, the uh, the health we've accumulated, the wealth we've accumulated. Are we so taken up with the plants that grew in our life, which we kind of feel as if it's deserved? Are we so concerned with that which we have that we've lost our concern for those who are in need of the grace and mercy of God? Are we so taken up with our health, wealth, safety, and we're not willing to go. And when we go, we go because we have to go. We give little tokens to kind of just toe the line. I've looked too bad. But are we having pity on whom he has pity? Do we care about what he cares about? And are we partnering with the grace? and the mercy of God. Him wanting to not give people what they deserve and give them a lot of things they don't deserve. Are we partnering with that? Are we all in journeying along with God's plans and God's purposes and God's ideas for our Nineveh, the place where He has sent May we overcome reluctance and not be 
like Jonah. Lord, I confess that so very often I am just like Jonah. Lord, my reluctance isn't always blatant running off to Tarsus. Lord, my reluctance is often indecision, negotiation, justification. Lord, my reluctance is sometimes just towing the line and going through the motions. Lord, I pray that you will do a deep work in me today as you do a deep work in the hearts of every person that is hearing this message. Lord, I choose to partner. I choose to grab a hold of you. Lord, would you cause me to be one that partners with grace, that partners with mercy, that seeks after opportunities to give people what they don't deserve and seek after opportunities to not give people what they do deserve, but Lord, to display the love and the grace and the mercy and the benevolence and the big heartedness of God in every space that I'm at, Lord. I pray that I will have a heart for what you have a heart for. Lord, would you break my heart for the things that break your heart in the city? And Lord, would you move me? Would you use me in their lives? Lord, would you break my heart for the things that break your heart in the the lives of colleagues and friends and neighbours, Lord God? And would you use me, God? Would you send me, God? I'm not gonna be a reluctant onlooker to the revival of God in the city of Austin. Lord, I wanna be an active participant in what you wanna do. Lord, may we not be the brothers that stay in the house, but never partake of all that is yours, that is ours. Lord, may we not settle for living lives void of spiritual gifts, void of the power of the gospel, void of the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, because it is more comfortable to just live a comfortable life. Lord, no, may we partake of all that is yours, all the grace and all the mercy and all the power and all the goodness, Lord. Lord, as we do, will you overturn? Will you overturn our lives, God? Would you come and make us new? Would you overturn lives in our midst? As we not reluctantly, but wholeheartedly run after you. In Jesus' name I pray.